Good morning, everyone. Let's all grab our hymn books in front of us. Hymn number 415, please. Hymn number 415, let's all stand together. Sing 415, the first, third, and fourth of Oh, I Want to See Him. Let's all stand together, please. Verse number one. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pierce my soul from without within. But my Lord leads me on, through him I must win. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all pass home at last, ever to rejoice. Number three. When in valleys low I look toward the mountain height, and behold my Savior there leading in the fight, with the tender hand outstretched toward the valley low. Guiding me I can see as I onward go. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory let me lift my voice. Cares I'll pass home at last, ever to rejoice. When before me billows rise from the mighty deep, then my Lord directs my bark, he does safely keep. And he leads me gently on through this world below. He's a frail friend to me, oh, I love him so. Want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares I'll pass home at last, ever to rejoice. Isn't it going to be a good day when we see the face of our Savior? and there's nothing else that we see but him. Isn't that going to be a great day? I can't wait for that. In fact, I'd be okay if that day was today. How many like the Lord Jesus just come back right now and all our sorrows and struggles and troubles would be over and we'd uh, live in, in, in heaven uh, forever. And if you're here today and you don't know that you're going to go to heaven, I hope you find that peace throughout the service today. We're so glad each of you are here. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church. And this is just a great time of the year. I'm loving the weather outside. The temperature is great. Uh, uh, how many of you are allergy sufferers? Can you raise your hand if you're an allergy sufferer? I am an allergy sufferer. I, didn't, I wasn't one until a couple of years ago. In fact, Wednesday night I wasn't here, uh, and I feel like a wimp. I feel like a wimp for missing out on allergies. But uh, my left eye was swollen shut because of the pollen uh, in the air. It looked like... I had been punched in the face by Angela, and I did not want to come to church and have Angela get in trouble for being a husband beater, and so I decided to leave, stay home so she wouldn't get accused of anything, right? I was trying to avoid the, the appearance of evil there. Uh, I'm teasing, of course, but uh, we were having a great time with the spring and everything. We're doing the Little League uh, baseball for the kids. And I'm wearing another hat around here. I'm not just the pastor. I'm now a coach. And so we're coaching. Uh, I'm coaching one of the coach pitch teams. And Brother J.R. Badat's coaching the other team. And if you see Brother Badat, let him know that my team beat his team yesterday. <laughs> Make sure you give him a real. It was a walk-off win. Um, uh, little Evan hit a, uh, hit a walk-off double, and we scored the winning runs there. And so my kids were jumping up and down for joy, and his were walking, out, walking off with their head hung low. 
I'm, I'm, I'm joking around somewhat, but we're having a great time with that. And uh, if you don't know, you don't know what to do yourself on a Saturday afternoon. We play those games every week at three o'clock. The the uh, the little little kids play at two thirty with a t ball stand and. Uh, uh, when they're not making dirt castles and, and they're actually paying attention. Uh, but uh, that's a lot of fun to watch. And at 3 o'clock, we have the game with the older kids. And so uh, we're selling concession stand, uh, hot dogs and hamburgers for our teenagers. They're going out to youth conference in the fall, and that's meant to help raise money for that. And so if you're a teenager, get involved and help out with that so you can raise money. And if you're just a church member, you'll want to come out. And that takes place at Eli Whitney Elementary uh, each Saturday at 3 o'clock. We're having a great time with that. A whole lot to do today. We're looking forward to a good time in the house of God. Let's greet one another in the Lord. Shake uh, everyone's hand around you and we'll come back and sing that chorus in just a moment. If you have your hymnals, go back to 415. We're going to sing verse 3, and then on the chorus, we're going to have the piano drop out. Here we go. When in valleys low I look toward the mountains hide, and behold my Savior there leading in the fight, with a tender hand outstretched toward the valley low. Think about it now. Guiding me, I can see as I onward go. Sing that chorus. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice and cares all past home at last ever to rejoice and let's have a word of prayer this morning as we worship him in spirit and in truth And let's remember Miss Myrtle Valerie. Uh, She is home from the hospital, but uh, is still struggling uh, with uh, various health issues uh, from her fall. Not able to be here with us today. We love Myrtle very much. Let's pray for her and ask God to give us a good day today in his house. Pastor Mike, if you would come and pray for us. Father, we thank you for letting us gather here and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, may your word be magnified. May uh, the songs, Lord, uplift and encourage We pray uh, that you bless our pastor as he brings forth the word in Jesus' name. Amen. You all may be seated. Hymn number 401, please, in your songbooks. Hymn 401, please. We'll sing, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. Number two, dark the night of sin has settled, loud the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Some poor sailor, tempest tossed, trying now to make the harbor. In the darkness may be lost. 
Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Ushers, if you'll make your way forward at this time, and if you're visiting with us today for the first time or you haven't been here in a while, we'd like to put a gift in your hand as well as a connection card. And so if you are visiting today, if you wouldn't mind, just slip up your hand and we'd have an usher get to you there and give you that uh, gift and that connection card. Anybody visiting today, first time or first time in a long time? All right, looks like our regular folks today. We're so excited you took time to be here today. At this time, our choir is going to come and sing for us. Grab your hymn books. Stand with me, 449, please. Let's all stand and sing hymn number 449, Near, Still Near, the first and last. Hymn 449. Verse 1. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious Thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to Thy breast. Shelter me 
safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Number four. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last. Till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages, ever to be. Savior, still nearer to Thee, nearer my Savior, still nearer to Thee. You can be seated, ushers, if you'll begin to make your way forward at this time. And let me just commend uh, the good people of White Oak Baptist Church, the faithful members, and being faithful in your giving. Uh, to the Lord. In the beginning of the year, we had some ups and downs with the offerings, but they've been very consistent steady over the last several weeks. And so if you are contributing to that, let me just say a big thank you. Uh, as, as all of you know, there is a wall between me and who gives. I don't know that, but I do see the weekly reports like you do in the bulletin there, and the giving's been right on par. And so thank you for your consistency and your faithfulness to give to the Lord. Just a quick reminder for you all, uh, we are having a tag sale here at our church coming up on June 3rd, and that'll be from early in the morning. I believe it starts at 10 a.m. If I have, is that right, Joan? Where are you at, Joan? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. and goes till 3. Is that right? I can't find you. There you are, 9 to 3. And so if you have signed up to help with that or you are interested in helping with that, there is going to be a meeting this evening at 515 in room 101 around the corner. And so make note of that and be in your place uh, for that meeting. And Miss Joan will be running that meeting. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God to bless our tithes, offerings, and faith promise giving. We ask Brother Pierre, if you would, lead us in prayer. Brother Pierre. My name is Lizette, and um, a lot of you know me, you're my home church, but I just came back from Golden State Baptist College. I'm back for the summer, but I just wanted to give you guys a word of encouragement just because I know um, every week doing the same thing over and over and over again every week, uh, I know sometimes it can get like as if nothing's happening or if you're not seeing results and things like that. But um, you know, something is happening. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized, especially um, from coming from a school where lots and lots of things are happening with um, our program there for the college ministries. I'm actually involved in one um, called the Bible Club, and we go to different neighborhoods, and um, the one that I'm in, we go to a certain neighborhood with uh, apartments, and we just keep knocking the doors and keep knocking the, the apartments, and we have a little song and uh, games too, and this little lesson that we do, but 
Uh, recently, actually, last week, one of our girls' uncle, we had been inviting them to church over and over again, and the girls actually got saved, but um, the girl's uncle was the one that we kept trying to um, come to church because he was really interested and he wanted to come. And so last week, he came and he went to North Valley at, at, in California, and he even brought a friend, which was really amazing, too. And not only did he come to church, but he also got saved and baptized the same morning. And then he came back for Sunday night church. So that was just one of the huge blessings in my life because that was the first time um, for me personally to invite somebody and actually have them come to church and actually see them at church. So that was so exciting for me. But um, I also want to give the younger folks who are looking into college, maybe thinking about different ones that they want to look at, but um, just ask yourself, what are you going to do for eternity? I know that a lot of a lot of kids nowadays, and like even even kids in church and stuff like that, but um, they think that oh, I need a career, oh, I need to make money, oh, I need to do this and that to have a good house and pay my phone bill and things like that. But honestly, like how Paul says, and that our life is like a vapor that it's not going to last for long. This life that we have right now is so little compared to all of eternity. So what are you going to do for eternity? Would you give your one year of maybe the 13th year after you're done with high school to God? Would you give it to um, maybe help people and give your life to God? Or, I mean, I know a lot of people do uh, do careers. Like my sister herself, she's not here right now, but she is doing a, a career in college. And, but she is still helping, still in school, um, sorry, in church. And that was a big blessing. And she helps with the singing and she helps with... Um, the music sometimes, and she helps Sunday schools and so many ministries, and I'm sure a lot of people could do that, but just as far as the young people looking as to what are you going to do with your life, just maybe consider maybe just giving just one year of Bible college, and I can totally recommend Golden State because I've been there, and I love it. I absolutely love it, and absolutely love that. There's so many things going on, so much, like, you can tell that God's power is in that place, and so I wanted to encourage you for to do that. So I um, also want to sing you a little song. <laughs> so much, Lizette. The singing today to me has just been extra good, extra good. The song the choir sang was written by a man who is on his way to die as a martyr. And he said in the last verse, when it's my time to die, give me Jesus. And so I enjoyed the choir special and enjoyed the heart that wrote the song and the hearts that sang the song. And then Lizette singing that, she is practicing what she's singing. Let me just encourage you with that. 
oftentimes we'll stand and we'll sing a song, I surrender all, I surrender all, and we're not careful, those words don't really mean much. Uh, let's try to live what we're singing. Lizette's giving her life to study for ministry at a Bible college. And so she stands up here and says, I don't need wealth and riches. I don't need earth's things. It's just my desire to live for Jesus. And I, I pray that's all of our heartbeat. Numbers chapter 22 in your Bibles. Numbers chapter 22. We'll be looking at the first six verses this morning. While you're finding your way over there, uh, we do have our Memorial Day picnic that is coming up. There is a place to sign up in the back for that as far as food that would be brought. I think A through L is bringing either sides or desserts, and then M through Z is bringing the opposite, but that's on the sign-up sheet in the back. And then we are going to have a 16-year-old and up softball game uh, for both men and women, and so it will be a co-ed game there. So if you're interested in playing in that game, you can sign up on the sheet or you can just show up at the picnic and we'll pick teams and play. But uh, that'll be a good time. Make plans now to join us on Memorial Day for our picnic. And that, that'll be my first one. It'll be my first one with you all. It's something you guys have been doing for years. And so I'm looking forward to great food, fun, and fellowship. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Numbers chapter 22. We'll read the first six verses of the chapter. I'm excited about this message today. In fact, I'm as excited to preach this sermon as I am any sermon I've preached since I've gotten here. And uh, there's a really neat truth that has been in Scripture all along, but uh, many people, if you're just reading on the surface, you would have missed it. And I'm excited to share that with you all today. We'll read the passage responsively. I'll read the odd verses alone. We'll read the even verses together. The Bible says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho, and Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Let's pray. God, I do ask today as we look at a, a passage, uh, this passage today, may we see it from the point of view that you intended for us to see it from. And Lord, as we look at our own lives and Lord, the journeys that we're traveling individually and then also as a church collectively, Lord, may we not just see the road right in front of us, but Lord, would you give us a long-term perspective. Lord, help us to see things through your eyeballs. Help us to see things through your sight. And Lord, help us to understand that sometimes along the path there are hard times but Lord, the hard times are sometimes where we've got to travel to get to uh, the good times and where you want us to be. And so Lord, I pray today that you'd help us to see with your sight and see things clearly uh, as you want us to. And be with us now today as we have the service. I pray, Lord, if there's one in our midst that has not yet trusted you for salvation, that does not know with absolute certainty that they're going to go to heaven, Lord, please convict their heart. I know two ladies came forward at the end of the 830 service to be saved. And Lord, I pray that would be the case in this service as well, that if there's even one that doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would get that eternity account settled once and for all. Be with us now in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. There was a shoe manufacturer who decided to open the Congo market. This was years and years ago. And so this... Uh, this uh, shoe manufacturer sent two salesmen to a very undeveloped territory within Congo. One shoe salesman uh, called back and he said, prospects here are nil, or there are no prospects. He said, nobody wears shoes. He said, fly me home. The other salesman reported enthusiastically, market has terrific potential Nobody wears shoes. Send me as many shoes as you can so we can sell them, sell out, uh, sell them all to everybody here. Everyone is barefooted. Uh, same situation, 
Two people saw it from two different perspectives. One looked at it from a very negative point of view. The other one looked at it from a very positive point of view. Perspective. Perspective. There was a, late, there was a, a college girl who wrote home. Actually, uh, this was a letter Lizette wrote to her parents. And, and Ben shared this with me. The letter goes like this. Just thought I'd drop you a note to clue you in on my plans... I've fallen in love with a guy called Jim. He quit high school after grade 11 to get married. About a year ago, he got a divorce. We've been going steady for two months and plan to get married in the fall. Until then, I've decided to move into his apartment. By the way, I think I might be pregnant. How many don't believe me that, that Lizette sent this letter to Ben? That didn't happen. At any rate, I dropped out of school last week, although I'd like to finish college sometime in the future. And then on the next page, the letter continued. The young lady wrote to her parents, she said, Mom and Dad, I just want you to know that everything I've written so far in this letter is false. None of it is true. But, Mom and Dad, it is true that I got a C in French and flunked my math class. And it is true that I'm going to need some more money uh, for my tuition. Perspective. Perspective. A C in French doesn't sound so bad anymore when you put it up against those circumstances. It sounds like this girl got an A in the class of manipulation, doesn't it? <laughs> For a Bible perspective on, uh, Bible view or Bible story on perspective, I think about David, uh, the shepherd boy, and King Saul. King Saul standing there, he's the king of the country, he's head and shoulders taller than all the other Israelites, the Bible tells us, and here comes Goliath of Gad. He storms down in the valley, beating his chest, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of a Hebrew man. Did he actually say that? Well, it's in the Hebrew. No, it's not. Uh, he came down, beating his chest, defying the armies of God, and what did Saul do? Saul went and ran and hid in his tent what did all the Hebrew soldiers do? They went and ran and hid in the caves and hid behind a rock. Saul looked at Goliath and he saw Goliath. David shows up and he's just a teenage boy. He's got food to give to his brothers who are warriors. And as he's conversing with his brothers, giving them the food, checking on their well-being, out comes big, mean, scary Goliath. And Goliath starts beating his chest Starts defying the armies of God. David's brothers take off running. And while everyone is running that direction away from Goliath, David starts walking toward Goliath. David's blood begins to boil as this man defies and curses his God. And David yells out, hey, who do you think you are? Saul, King Saul, he saw the giant. Little David saw the God behind the giant. When you have a problem come in your life, do, are you looking at the problem or are you looking at the God behind the problem? You ever shake your fist up toward heaven or tempted to do so and say, God, what are you doing up there? How could you let this happen to me? How could you let these circumstances take place? I heard one person put it this way. When we shake our fists at God or we're tempted to do so, that's like the guy at the bottom of the mountain trying to tell the guy standing on the top of the mountain what he can see on the other side of the mountain. My friend, God is up in heaven. He sees your past. He sees your present. And He sees your future. You have this big mountain standing in front of you called the future. And while you can speculate what's on the other side, you don't know what's on the other side of that mountain. But there is a God who sees the future and He is allowing today's events. He has allowed yesterday's events to take place because He is trying His best to prepare you for what's coming down the road in your future. Perspective perspective. Today in our story, uh, one that would be familiar to someone who's gone to church for any length of time or anyone who's read through their Bible, we come to a story of Balak, King Balak, King of the Moabites, King, King of the Midianites. And we have here uh, Balaam. Balaam is uh, the soothsayer or the sorcerer of his day. 
And here we see that Balak had the wrong perspective on what was going on. This morning I propose that oftentimes we fail to stop and try and see a larger picture of what God is trying to accomplish in our lives. I propose that the cross of Christ can be seen in even the bleakest of situations. This morning I'd like for us to look at an old familiar story about Balak and Balaam and see this story from a fresh biblical example. If you're taking notes this morning, and I encourage you to do that, point number one of the message is this, the Moabites fear. The Moabites fear. And let me just uh, take a break out of the message and say to the people in our sound booth, uh, if you could make sure on the live stream you've got me and the screen focused in there. All right, excellent. Good job. All right, Numbers chapter 22 and verse 1. If you look down there with me, we'll see the Moabites fear. The Bible says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Now that's important. We'll come back to that in a minute. Notice verse 3. And Moab was sore afraid, was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab, notice this, was distressed. They're sore afraid. They were distressed because of the children of Israel. What do we have here? We have the Israelites beginning to move in and move on to the territory of where the Moabites lived, the Midianites lived. Moab would have been a town inside the greater region of Midian, and uh, they are approaching the land of the Midianites. They are approaching the outskirts of the town of Moab, and here they come marching like an army across the wilderness, and they had just passed the Amorites. They had defeated the Amorites. They had wiped wiped out the Amorites, and now here they came to the Midianites, and the people were wringing their hands in fear. Word had gotten back at what had happened to the Ammonites. You ask, well, pastor, what happened to the Ammonites? Well, just to put it plain, the Israelites came up on the Ammonites, and they defeated them. They wiped them out. They destroyed them. You say, well, why would God allow the Israelites to destroy or kill off the Amorites. Back in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, the Bible says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Is not yet full. The Amorites lived all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. This is God speaking to Abraham. Abraham's walking past the territory where the Amorites lived and God did not want Abraham to mess with or have anything to do with the Amorites. And God told Abraham, He said, the reason is, is because their sin or their time of sin is not yet full. There needs to be a time, there will be a time where their sin has come to fruition, where that harvest is going to come in on the reaping of the sin they're doing, and I will rain down destruction on the Amorites because of their sin. Just a quick note here, God's timing works different than our timing. Works different than our timing. Uh, I know in my home when my children's do, children do wrong, I'm quick to punish and you ought to do the same thing. Uh, don't wait till you're all frustrated and flustered to punish your children. You need to frustrate, uh, uh, punish them when you're not frustrated and get them to obey you with, with just a whisper. But God doesn't always work that way with us. Sometimes He will allow us to sin and to sin and to sin and to sin. And there seems to be no consequences on those sins. But there will come a day where that sin comes to be full or comes to fruition and God rains down his judgment on us. And so, yes, for four generations, the Amorites would sin. For four generations, their sin would grow. The idolatry, the paganism, the heathen lifestyle. And God, after four generations of it, finally reached a point where he said, that's enough. By the way, the Amorites had grown great in power. Their kings were prominent names in the world scene. Their names were Sihon and Og. They were big deals. In fact, you find all the way through the history of the Israelites throughout the Bible, 
that the prophets remind the people that this is the God that defeated Sion and Og. These were names that lived on in not only Israeli uh, 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 infamy, but, but really the world history they lived in infamy. Uh, this would be like an Adolf Hitler or a Benito Mussolini or a Joseph Stalin. Those names live on in infamy on the world history scene. Yes, they live on in Germany and in Italy and in Russia, but live on even today on the world scene. That's how big of a deal Sion and Og were. And here came the Israelites marching through the desert, and God commanded Moses, it's time to lead you, uh, your puny uh, uh, army into war against them, and I will defeat the Amorites. The Amorites had been wiped out. And here you had the little Moabitish army, the little Mennonite army. They're looking down the road and saying, look, if they made quick work of the Amorites, we don't stand a chance. Our army is nothing compared to theirs. And the people begin to worry. The people begin to fear. The people begin to become very afraid. And they turn to their leader, King Balak, who was the idolatrous heathen of them all. And they say, will you please do something to help us? And so Balak looks at his arm and he says, that the answer is not going to be a military answer. And so point number two, we see King Balak's faith. King Balak's faith. Instead of turning to a military answer, King Balak turns to an answer of faith. Now, you say, well, pastor, you just got through talking about how heathen he was and how he was an idolater. Uh, uh, what are you going to now talk about him being a man of faith? He was a man of faith, but that doesn't mean his faith was a good thing. Sometimes when I'm out uh, in the neighborhoods around the church, and, and abroad, I'll ask someone, uh, what do you think it takes for a person to get to heaven? What are you relying on to get you to heaven? And one of the answers I get back from people, I get back this answer, I have faith. And I stop and think, hmm. Now, how many of you here believe that faith is a major element to salvation? Can I see your hand if you believe that? It is. But just having faith in general saves nobody. It's what or who you have faith in. Do you know that every one of you today exercised a great deal of faith to get to church? How many of you either drove a car or rode in a vehicle to get to church today? That would be all of you. I don't think anybody walked to church. Can I ask you a question? Did you know all those people that you passed on the road to get here? Did you interview each one of them and say, okay, all right, all the people I'm going to drive past on the way into church today, I've talked to all of them, I've looked at their driving records, I have seen with my own eyes that they're capable drivers and they're not going to hit me on my way into church. How many of you did that today? You got in your car and you put it in drive and you went down a road with a double yellow line on it without knowing the person in the other vehicle, and by faith, you trusted that they were not going to come over and hit you. You say, uh, uh, is faith something just some people have? No, no, no. All of us live every day by faith. How many of you, before you sat down in that pew today, you got down on your hands and knees and you looked under it to see the structure of it? Nobody did that. You say, well, pastor, I've sat in these pews many times. I've already tried them out. How about the very first time you walked in this auditorium and you sat in a pew? Did you get down and check the pew out? No, no, no. You trusted that it would hold you up and you sat down. You see, faith is a staple of everybody's life. Even the atheist who says, oh, I don't believe in a God. Do you know that even that atheist has to have some belief about how we got here and even he has faith? Your faith might be in the theory of evolution. And I'm going to emphasize theory, the theory of evolution. You know why it's called a theory is because it's a belief system. I cannot prove, I cannot replicate in a laboratory creation. I can't do it. I can't get God to come down and go into a laboratory and show everyone how we created everything from nothing. But the evolutionist can't go into a laboratory and recreate the Big Bang either. So it's a faith system. Balak had a faith system. What did he believe in? Well, look down at Numbers chapter 22 and verse 7. 
Here we find Balak, he is going to send the elders of Moab and Midian uh, off to Balaam to try to convince him to come. Notice how the reward is described in Numbers 22, 7. The Bible says there, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination. Rewards of divination. That idea of divination is uh, uh, has to do with the occult or foretelling the future through a demonic presence. We'll see later that um, uh, actually in the end of chapter 22, I believe it, uh, verse 41 there, it talks about the high places of Baal. The high places of Baal, there was idolatrous bowing down to a graven image. And anytime you find idol worship in the Bible, they're not just bowing down to a piece of stone. They're bowing down to a demonic presence behind the stone. There is a greater power behind that stone that they're bowing down to. And so uh, uh, just like Jezebel and Ahab, here you have Balak many, many years before. He is a man of the occult. He is a man of sorcery that believes in sorcery and witchcraft, and they send uh, the elders of Moab and Midian to who? To a man who is a, 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 a prophet of the occult. Look down at chapter 23 and verse 23. We see even more evidence of this. Here you have uh, Balaam now talking to Balak about uh, the curse that uh, Balak wants Balaam to put on God's people. And Balaam says to Balak, he says, surely there is no enchant enchantment against Jacob. And the word enchantment clearly is a word of sorcery. Neither is there any divination against Israel. He's saying, I can't use satanic uh, 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 presence or oppression on these people. Yes, Balaam was good at that. Balaam knew that, but Balaam was not allowed by God. You might remember when uh, 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 demon-possessed people came in the presence of Jesus. What did they do? They'd throw themselves down and they'd worship Jesus because a satanic presence, when standing up directly to the divine God of heaven, has to submit and come under every time. And here you have Balaam here you have someone who is a sorcerer, someone who practices divinations, someone who practices enchantment. He cannot do what King Balak wants him to do. So we see here, point number one, we see the Moabites fear. Here come God's people, the Israelites, and they are trembling in their boots. Number two, we see King Balak's faith. Balak gathers together the elders of the city of Moab and of the country of Midian, and he sends them over to Balaam, who is a renowned sorcerer. And they send them with great riches, with great rewards, and says to them, they say, uh, Balaam, will you please come and curse these people? And Balaam was smart enough to know that he was not going to be allowed to curse God's people without God's permission. Now, he was smart enough to know that, I'll give him that. But he was actually dumb enough to tell the man, hey, lodge in my house tonight and let me go into God and let me see if he will give me permission to curse God's people. Now, wait a minute, Balaam. You're going to ask God if you can curse his people. What? What do you think God said? No. You may not curse my people. Balaam wakes up in the morning. He goes back out to the elders of Midian and Moab. And he says, God says no. And if God doesn't say I can do it, then I can't do it. Guys, you got to go. And so out the house they go and down the road they go. Balak was desperate. Balak knew that the end of his life and the extinction of his people was just down the road. And so in desperation... He sends uh, uh, people with, that are more renowned back uh, in order to try to tempt Balaam yet again. Number three, we see this. We see Balaam's folly. Balaam's folly. Here come these people with great rewards. In fact, letter A, we see his appetite. Speaking of Balaam, his appetite. Look down with me again at Numbers chapter 22 in verse number 7. The Bible says there, "...and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian..." departed with the rewards of divination, the rewards of divination in their hand. What did they come with? They came with money. 
They came with gold and silver and fine jewelry and, and expensive clothing. And they, they came in, in, uh, with their caravan of camels and donkeys. And they're, 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 they're uh, showing all these things to Balaam. And they're saying, Balaam, if you'll just come and you'll curse these people, uh, King Balak will give you all of this stuff. And Balaam looks at it and goes, ooh, ah. Boy, I would really like to, ooh, man, I, I've really been wanting that coat. I've, I've passed that in the store a hundred times, and I've, I've wanted to buy it, and it's just been a little bit out of my price range, and all i got to do is just uh, uh, professionally go and curse these people, and I can have that. Oh, man, that is so tempting. That wasn't enough to get him. Look down at verse 15. Balak sends yet again other princes. And look down at verse 15. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Notice the desperation in their voice. Thus saith, saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Uh, come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. How desperate was Balak? Balak basically took a blank contract with the signature of King Balak at the bottom and said, Balaam, you write on here whatever you want. As long as you'll come and curse these people, you can have it whether it's riches or honor or power or position. Now, God had already told Balaam, no. But the stakes were so high and Balaam's appetites were so carnal that he says to these princes and these elders, he said, come and stay the night again and I will go in and talk to God. I will go in and talk to God. And so this sorcerer goes into the presence of God and he says, may I please have permission to curse the Israelites? And God very sarcastically says to Balaam in a prayer, sure, Balaam, go ahead. Sure, okay, you want to curse my people? Go ahead and go, go ahead and go. How many of you ever use sarcasm as a way to make a point? More of you need to be raising your hands because you're lying right now. It's a very sarcastic church. And so Balaam's like, oh, all right, I got permission from God to go curse his people. He wakes up in the next, the next morning, there's an extra spring in his step, and he's like, man, I'm going to get all that gold, I'm going to get all that silver, I'm going to get that prominent position, I'm going to be an honorable person in the country, uh, this is great, and, and a spring in his step, and he gets on his donkey, and off he goes with these princes and these elders, and he's going to go curse God's people. And on the way, all of a sudden, this donkey of his that he's riding on decides it's just going to sit down in the middle of the road. Now, you've got to picture this, if you will. Balaam, who's the prominent sorcerer in the land, is riding with the top dogs in the country. And ba Balaam's trying to be on his best behavior. He, you know, like when you have company over, you're trying to make sure everything looks just right. The rest of the time, it's a mess. But when people are coming over, you try to make it look just right. And so he's got, you know, he's, he's doing everything just right. He's carrying himself as professional as possible. He's trying to ride his donkey. And he's probably saying to his donkey, you stupid animal, you better be on your best behavior. And he's riding down the road, and the donkey just sits down in the middle of the road. And he's thinking, what are you doing? And he gets off and he beats the donkey and the donkey stands up and down the road he goes. Next thing you know, they're going through a bridge. And the bridge has walls on both sides and the donkey smashes his foot up against the wall. Oh, he screams, he's in pain. He gets off the donkey and he's beating the donkey as hard as he can. You stupid animal. He gets back on the donkey and they're riding along again and they're going down the road and all of a sudden the donkey just takes a hard ride into the vineyard. And he's beating the donkey. Letter B, we see his anger. His anger. Look down at verse 27. The, the, the biblical word for donkey is the word ass. You know, that's not a way we use that word in modern day English, but when the King James Bible was translated, that was the common word for a donkey. The Bible says, when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindred, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, here we have Mr. Ed in the Old Testament, 
What have I done to thee that thou smitest me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would uh, there have a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden every day, or ever since I was uh, uh, thine unto this day? And, and was I ever wont to, to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. And you can read on the rest of the conversation. Look, it's bad enough that the donkey's talking to him. He actually replies. He's having a conversation with this animal. And let me just stop and say this here, that this actually happened. You say, oh, pastor, come on. Uh, this is just some uh, uh, literary al allegory. And, and this never, act no, no, no. God can open the mouth of any animal at any point uh, to speak if that's what he chooses to do. And God opened the mouth of this animal and this animal spoke. By the way, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, the serpent had a conversation with Eve and Eve not thought nothing of it. Could it be that when Adam and Eve sinned and the curse was put on mankind, that animals went from having the ability to speak to having their mouths closed? I think that's very, very possible and very, even very probable. And so God simply removed the curse off this donkey that had been put in the Garden of Eden. And here the donkey is conversing with Balaam, and Balaam is so angry, he doesn't even realize he's having a conversation with a donkey. Do you ever realize that your anger will allow you to act in a way that is foolish? You ever want to get a good laugh? Go to YouTube and turn the volume down and watch an adult throw a temper tantrum. Watch how they fling their hands around and ah, get all red in the face and they're throwing things. And If it wasn't so ridiculous, you'd probably get more of a laugh out of it. The truth is, that video could have been made of me at times. It probably could have been made of you. What causes us to get angry? Can I just go back from a micro sense and back back out on a macro sense of the sermon here? We get angry when we refuse to look at our situation through the sight of the Savior. When we're not looking at our circumstance through the bird's eye view of God, boy, we can get upset. We can get angry, and we lose our focus on what God's trying to accomplish. That difficulty in your life, that circumstance that isn't going your way, that boss that talks down to you at work, that spouse that isn't acting the way that you want your spouse to act, that child that's acting out of hand, that situation that just has you so frazzled, that clerk at the store that was rude to you. Boy, are we that guy on the, the mountain that's looking at the guy on the top of the mountain and saying, I can see better than you? Boy, let's not get angry. Let's not lose our temper like Balaam did here. So we see his appetites. He was hungry for money and hungry for power, and he was willing to sell his soul to get possessions and, and, and power. And we see uh, his anger, Balaam's folly. Number four, notice Balak's frustration. Balak's frustration. The angel of the Lord there uh, was the reason why that donkey was falling down. There was a sword in that angel's hand, and that sword was going to kill Balaam. And so the donkey was simply trying to save Balaam's life. And at the very end of that conversation, we find that the eyes of Balaam are open, and he's now able to see the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord tells Balaam, what are you even doing making this trip? And Balaam, oh, I, th I thought you said I could. And he said, no, 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 no. I told you at first, no. That should have been good enough for you. He said, listen, you can go ahead and go, but you're only going to say what I allow you to say. Basically, Balaam, God is going to take over your mouth and He is going to speak through you. You are going to become the mouthpiece of, of God. Go ahead and go. And so Balaam arrives in Moab, and, and Balak is just pacing the floor in his palace, probably, just 
uh, impatiently waiting for Balak to arrive. And ba- Balak uh, uh, receives Balaam and, 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 and shakes his hand and basically falls down and worships him and says, Look, we, we, we can't let any grass grow under our feet. Uh, those Israelites are going to come and wipe us out at any moment. He said, Come with me. And in the end of Numbers chapter 22, he takes him up into the high places of Baal. And, uh, he, 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 and Balaam says to Balak, Go ahead and sacrifice seven uh, sacrifices of animals. And after all the labor of the sacrifices have been done, Balak, or Balaam says to Balak, I'll be back in just a minute. Balaam gets off to the side and he meets with the Lord. And the Lord says, okay, here's what you're going to say. And Balaam goes back over and stands at a vantage point where he can see the Israelites. And look down at verse number 5 of Numbers 23. The Bible says, And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth, He took over Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. So they've got all the top guns there, and this is the time. Balaam's going to curse the people, right? Verse 7, And he took up his parable and said, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? And the number on the fourth part of Israel, let me die the death of the righteous." And let me last end uh, uh, be like his. Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. Balak, he's desperate. He he sins for Balaam. He offers him basically the entire kingdom and says, please, just come. Balaam shows up. He takes him up to the top of uh, this high place and he offers these sacrifices. And this is the time he really believes with all of his heart that Balak's going to curse these people and it's going to make a difference. And Balak opens his mouth and instead of cursing God's people, he blesses God's people. And I can see uh, uh, Balak back there, and he is just dumbfounded. He is speechless. What? You are one of us? You're cursing the people that are going to come and kill you. What are you doing? And he thinks to himself, well, a good night, let's try this again. So down out of the high place they go, and up to the top of Pisgah they go, and, and uh, seven sacrifices later, Balaam slips off to the side and, and, and meets with God and then comes back over, and again, he blesses God's people. Look down in chapter 23, verse 25. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. Balak says, listen, if you're not going to curse them, at least don't bless them. Shut your mouth! Stop blessing the people that are going to kill us. Balaam turns to Balak and says, look, buddy, I told you. I am the mouthpiece of God. He is speaking through me. I can't even control my own lips. And Balak's desperate. He's really desperate. So down off of Pisgah they go, and up to the top of another mountain they go. Again, the seven sacrifices, this time Balaam doesn't even go aside to meet with God because he already knows what's going to be said. I believe the other two times Balaam was probably trying to argue with God so that he would have liberty over his own tongue. And God said, nope, you're going to say what I tell you to say. And so the third time Balaam stands there and he, he again, God takes over his mouth and he blesses the people of God. Numbers chapter 24 and verse 10, we see the frustration of Balak just boil over. The Bible says, and Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam and he smote his hands together. And Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee to curse mine enemies and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Notice that three times. Times. That's important here. A lot of threes in the passage, uh, uh, and, and those fit in uh, allegorically to what I'm about to show you here in just a moment. But to the point here is that when you try to go against God, when you try to live your life contrary to God's way and God's people, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's frustrating at best. It's frustrating at best. It is a losing effort. 
you sit here today and you are living your lifestyle that's in contradiction to Scripture, can I promise you something? It's only going to bring about frustration and more frustration and more frustration. Here you have Balak, the king of the Moabites. He calls in Balaam. He says, curse God's people. And Balaam doesn't. And you know what? He gets frustrated over it. And if you want to live your life in contrary, in contradiction to Scripture, it's going to bring more and more and more frustration. God says in His Word, you are to be in God's house every time the doors are open. You say, but pastor, I don't want to be in God's house every time the doors open. I only want to come on Sunday mornings. And the Bible says in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're a day closer to Christ coming back now than we were yesterday. And tomorrow will be another day closer. Even more reason to be faithful to the house of God. But pastor, I don't want to do it. It doesn't matter. If you want to live contrary to the word of God, you're only going to bring frustration on your life. But pastor, I want to watch that TV show. But God's Word says. But I don't care what God's Word says. Go ahead and be frustrated. But pastor, I don't want to go soul winning. Well, I'm sorry. God's Word says. I don't care what God's Word says. Well, then you're going to live frustrated. The idea there is bring your life in and under the submissive hand of what God's Word says and watch as the frustrations of life fall by the wayside. Number five, we see Israel's formation. Israel's formation. And this is where we're going to get down into some of the details of Scripture. And if you're just a surface reader of your Bible, you would have never seen this. If you like to dig deep and get neat nuggets out of Scripture, I'm going to show you something that's really, really fascinating here. Letter A, first notice where Balaam stood. Look back with me, look back with me at Numbers chapter 22 and verse 41. Will you look there with me in your Bibles? Numbers chapter 22 and verse 41. And when I pause... When I pause my reading, I want everybody out loud to read the next two, ver two words together with me. Okay, Numbers chapter 22 and verse 41. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places. The high places of Baal. He took him up to a high place where they could oversee all the Israelites. Here you have the Israelites dwelling down below them and they're standing up high where they can see the entire camp of the Israelites, okay? So that was the first time. He takes them out, down off of there, chapter 23 and verse 14. Look there with me. Chapter 23 and verse 14. It says there, And he brought him into the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah, the top of Pisgah. So where are they standing? For the first time, when he blesses, they're standing in a high place. The second time, they're standing on the top of Pisgah. Look at chapter 23 and verse 28. Chapter 23 and verse 28. The Bible says, And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor. The top of Peor. All three times, all three times, Balak takes Balaam where he can look out and he can oversee the entire camp of the Israelites. They had a bird's eye view over the Israelites. So you ask, well, pastor, they're up there and they're looking down on the Israelites. What exactly did they see? Well, I'm glad you asked. Letter B, what Balaam saw. What Balaam saw. And I would encourage you later to go to Numbers chapter 2, as I did in preparation for this sermon, and read this for yourself, and, and, and uh, be like the church of Bree that proves that what I'm telling you is true. But in Numbers chapter 2, we find exactly what Balaam and Balak and the nobles and princes saw. They looked down and they saw how God had told Moses to form the Israelites. Can you put that next slide up there for me? We know Zebulun reside, next slide, on the east side of the tabernacle. The east side of the tabernacle. If you go through and you count, and I've rounded these numbers off, but uh, not drastically rounded off, I think the count here is 186,200. I lopped off the 200, but uh, you can go through and and uh, read and get the exact numbers. They're very, what I have on the screen is very close to uh, what uh, the Bible tells us there. Rounded down or up to the nearest thousand there. But 186,000 people dwelled in the camp of Judah and Zebulun. This is a 1,6,000 scale 
of what would have been that day. Each one of those tents represents 6,000 uh, people. And so uh, Judah and Zebulun were on the east side. You say, well, pastor, why do you think that God put Judah on the east side? Well, uh, Cairo, if you're traveling from Cairo, Egypt, over toward uh, where uh, modern-day Israel today is or where they were going, they would have been traveling from west to east. Judah was the firstborn. Judah was leading the Israelites across the desert there. So Judah and Zebulun dwelling on the east side, 186,000 of them. Put the next slide up there for me. Uh, uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad were commanded to dwell on the south side of the tabernacle. And we know from scripture there were 151,000 of them. On the Let's see, west side, put the next slide up. You have the tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. There were 108,000 of them. And on the south side, you have Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And there were, next slide, 151, or 157, rather, thousand of them. Give me the next slide. What did Balak and Balaam see? as they stood up on Pisgah and Peor in the high places of Baal and looked down on the Israelites. God had formed His people in the shape of a cross. The Israelites marched through the wilderness in the shape of a cross. Every time God from heaven looked down on His people as they traveled, the 40 years they were in the wilderness, He looked down and He was reminded that His Son would be birthed through the tribe of Judah dwelling on the east side there, and that His Son would die on the cross. Balak and Balaam stand there and they look down on the children of Israel. And for the record, they didn't know what a cross was. Crucifixion wasn't a form of punishment back then. But they look down and Balaam said, I can't curse them. You say, why was it that God was not allowing this sorcerer to curse the children of Israel? Because God was protecting the symbolism of the cross. God was not going to allow a man who had satanic powers to curse the cross of Jesus Christ. Three times. Three times He blessed the cross. Does anybody know how many days Jesus lied dead in the ground after He died on the cross? Three days. Three days. Listen, you can't make this stuff up, folks. You can't make this stuff up. Balaam stands there and he blesses God's people as he looks down and he sees the cross. By way of conclusion, I've jotted down some parallels here between what Balaam saw and how it applies to you and I today and really even what happened there. The first thing I wrote down in my conclusion is this, there were sinners, there were sinners that made up the cross. Let's see if I can get this here to work. In every one of these tents right here, there lived sinners. Every one of them. God looked down, and He looked at the tribe of Levi, and the, and the Levites that lived around the tabernacle, and He saw sinners. He looked over here to Judah and, and, and Zebulun, and He saw sinners. He looked in Dan and Gad and Asher and all these others, and he, Benjamin and Ephraim, and He saw sinners. Sinners. You know, Jesus Christ would come from the tribe of Judah. Oop, can you bump that back for me? From the tribe of Judah. He would be birthed through one of these tents right here. And one day, as the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, He would become the sin of everybody that lived in every one of these tents. But not only would He become their sin, he would become your sin. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 tells us, For all have sin. You say, Pastor, I'm a really good person. Can I tell you today that you might do good deeds, but God calls you the same as He calls me, sinner. 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 There was sin that made up that cross. 
And when Jesus Christ would hang on the cross one day, the Bible tells us this. It says, He that knew no sin became our sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God through Him. The cross there in that wilderness was filled with sin. And the cross where Jesus died became a place where the man who hung on it became my sin and your sin. The second application I see from there that day that applies to here today is that the heathen refused to accept the cross. Here you have Balak and Balaam. Balak represents the political power of Midian. Balaam represents the uh, spiritual power of Midian. And they look down at the cross and both of them out and out reject it. Now Balaam had to bless it because he was forced to, not because he wanted to. Balaam in his heart hated what he saw. Hated what he saw. Can I tell you, friend, today, there is only one way a person goes to hell. There is only one thing that sends a person to hell. It isn't murder. It isn't suicide. It isn't abortion. It isn't lying. It isn't pedophilia. And all those are terrible things. You say, Pastor, what sends a person to hell? The same thing that sent Balak and Balaam and the Midianites to hell. The rejecting of the cross. You see, you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't need the cross to get to heaven. I'm a really good person. And I'm here to tell you that you're not a very good person, not in comparison to a holy God who's never committed a single sin. Jesus came and He lived and He died. Balak and Balaam looked at the cross and they said, Not for me. Not for me. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages or the payment or the paycheck or the earnings of your sin, the breaking of God's law is death or separation or eternal damnation from a holy God. Who ends up going to hell? Those that reject the cross. Who ended up dying and, and, and being abolished off the planet? The Moabites a couple of chapters later. Why? Because they rejected the cross. If you're here today, I'm going to encourage you, don't look at the cross of Christ and reject it any longer. The third application I see from this cross that the Israelites made up and Balaam and Balak as they stood there and they looked at it is that the sacrifices that took place within the cross. Again, right here inside uh, the tabernacle, or rather around the tabernacle, we know is a courtyard. And right inside the door of the tabernacle was a brazen altar. And uh, they were commanded uh, in Leviticus chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 to take an animal and to bring that to that courtyard. And they were to bring that animal in and they were to have it checked and it was to be spotless and it was to be clean. And the priest would lay that lamb, lay that ox, lay those turtle doves on on that brazen altar, and there inside uh, that courtyard where that brazen altar was, blood was spilled to atone for sin. All the while, in these tents, there are children being born. And one of those children would have a child. And that child would have a child. And that child would have a child. And one day, Mary would have the Christ child, Jesus and while people are having babies there over in the, uh, the, the Judean tents, one of those children would one day become the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, that all of those lambs that were sacrificed there inside uh, that courtyard would represent the Lamb of God, would pay for your sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You're here today, you say, how do I get to heaven? You've got to allow the atoning, cleansing blood of Christ to wash the sins off your record and off your soul. The last thing I see out of this passage is that salvation, the salvation that came from the cross. You see, I imagine a little boy going into his cattle with his dad Maybe picking that favorite lamb, that choice firstborn lamb that was without spot. And they walking from their tent over to the tabernacle. And that little boy looks up at his dad and says, Dad, why does that lamb have to die? And the dad looks at his little boy and he says, One day, son, there will come a day when our Messiah will become the sacrifice 
for the sins of the world. And that little boy going back to his tent and getting down on his knees next to his cot and saying, Jehovah, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I believe that you are going to die and be the atonement for my sin. I believe in you. My friend, you get saved the same way. You don't earn salvation. It's a gift. It's free. And you say, how do I get it? You have to extend your hand of faith. And you have to believe. You have to believe on the... Back, back it up here. You have to believe on the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ that's found in the Israelites as they march through the wilderness. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Have you lost some perspective this morning? Here the Israelites are living in the wilderness, walking through sand, eating manna, complaining and griping and murmuring about how hard they have it. And yes, God sees the murmuring, but God looks down and He sees the cross. You know, God wants to take your hardships, sir. He wants to take that disappointment, ma'am. And He wants you to allow Him to show others the cross through you. How many here this morning would say, Pastor Lejeune, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have put my faith in the cross for my eternal salvation. And when I die, I'll be in heaven with Jesus because of my faith in Him. If that's you, would you very proudly or very, uh, very uh, uh, happily slip up your hand if you know God has redeemed your sins. How many here today would say, Pastor, I wasn't able to raise my hand because truth be told, I have not accepted the sacrifice of Christ, the blood atonement of Christ for my sin. I'm not sure that if I were to die, God would grant me access to His heaven. Pastor, I don't know that, but I would like to know that. My friend, if that's you and you're here today, I do not want to embarrass you. I don't want to make a spectacle of you, but I do want to pray for you. The reason why everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed is so that you and I, you and I can have a moment where I can see you in admission that you don't know. I won't call out your name, but I would like to pray for you. Is there one here today that says, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I were to die, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to know that. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? I just don't know. We had two ladies this morning raise their hand, come down front, and trust Christ. Is there anyone else that would like to do that? How many here today say, Pastor, I have lost some perspective on what God is trying to do through me. I have not been seeing my situation through the sight of my Savior. I've been seeing my situation through the wrong perspective. Pastor, pray for me that God will give me a proper perspective and what I'm going through right now. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. Many hands. And how many here today would say, Pastor, I'm going through a tough time. There's a lot of heartache and hurt in my heart right now while the storms of life blow around me. Pray for me, Pastor, as I endure this storm. How many of you say, Pastor, pray for me as I endure this storm? Lord, I do pray for those that are going through a tough time. And God, you don't only see the hand that's raised and the hands that aren't raised. You see the problems, the hurt, the struggles that many carry. And Lord, you know them. And Lord, you grieve with them much like you did with Mary and Martha there as Lazarus died. Lord, I pray you be very close to them and, 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 and pull them, draw them to you. Lord, I pray if there's one here today that has not trusted in the cross of Christ, would you help them to do that? Lord, would you help us today to be people who put the cross first? Lord, where there's appetites that are out of line, where there's a temper problem that flares. Lord, may we confess those things today. Give us a proper perspective. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed as the piano begins to play. The altar's open for invitation. Brother Owens will be...